here at Restoration Church, uh, as we gather for worship, uh, the vision that God's given to us as a church is that we are a church of imperfect people, right, helping our community embrace the life-restoring grace of Jesus together. And so as we gather for worship, this is one way for us to embrace God's grace, right, to come into his presence, to, to sing songs, to pray, to hear from his word, and to share in communion. And so we gather in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it's it's great to be together. And so as we gather at this, uh, this, this, at this time, know that um, for us, uh, whether you're, if you're here, we, we pray and ask that you consider, if, if you feel led to, to sing, we have, we'll keep our masks on. We're doing everything we can to gather safely and faithfully. Uh, but you're welcome to sing if you feel led to sing uh, throughout the worship service. Uh, if you're at home, if you're watching online, uh, sing along as well. Uh, tonight's, uh, today's, uh, the focus for today of Advent is peace. Uh, last week we focused on hope. So if you think of the word peace, right, there's lots of different definitions of peace. But a biblical understanding of peace is not merely an absence of conflict. But biblical peace is a sense of wholeness, of flourishing, of oneness and well-being. Right? So much of the world is broken. And it only takes this year, 2020, perhaps more than any other year, to see how broken this world is, right? If I'm not actually going to break it, but if I did, um, it's like taking a hammer right, to this plate and smashing it and having it fall into pieces. It would be a visual image of brokenness. But the good news of Jesus Christ, the good news of the Bible is that God is a God who puts our lives back together. Our God is a God who restores, the one who provides perfect peace. And so we come in this Advent season, the season of anticipation, waiting for Christmas. As we move towards Christmas, we come with a sense of expectancy and anticipation, right? Thousands of years ago, those who were waiting for the Messiah, the one who would bring peace. And now in this time, as we wait for the return of Christ, for ultimate peace, where he will put fully everything back together. But in the meantime, we get a taste of it. And we get a taste of it even tonight as we worship together. So as I light this candle in Advent for, for, for peace, may we continue to look to Jesus for hope and for peace. Let me read from Isaiah, from Isaiah 26, a couple verses to set our hearts on Christ in terms of his peace for us. Verse 3, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord and the Lord himself is the rock eternal. The path of the righteous is level. You, the upright one, make the way of the, un, of the righteous smooth. Yes, Lord, walking in the way of your laws, we wait for you. Your name and renown are the desire of our hearts. Man, what a great prayer. That, Right, that God's name and his renown would be the desire of our hearts. Uh, let me pray for us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, that we pray that you would make that our desire. That we would want your name to be lifted up. And God, in this season, this Advent season, as we set our focus on you afresh, moving towards Christmas and the celebration of the birth of your son, Jesus. Father, we pray now you would meet us with your perfect grace. You would meet us with your perfect peace. And you promise, Lord, to keep those who look to you in perfect peace as we trust in you. So we offer ourselves in worship to you. We offer ourselves now in song and in, in prayers and in the sermon and communion, Lord, as we offer ourselves to you that you would meet us with your grace and you would allow us to embrace your grace together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, come, let us adore him. Let's stand and worship together. And if you feel safe singing behind that mask, for those who are here in person, please sing along. And those of us who are going to be joining us virtually, um, I pray that you can worship with us in one body um, and one spirit today. So, oh, come, all you faithful, let us adore him.
Uh, you can grab a seat. Uh, before we have our time of offering, I wanted to say a word of thanks to those who have offered in a significant way recently. Um, the Saturday before Thanksgiving, we had nine Bless Our Neighbors Day teams, or we had five Bless Our Neighbors Day teams doing nine projects throughout our area. And it was awesome. We had a great, uh, great group. We did lots of leaves, lots of other things. And one of my joys is getting to interact with people who had projects done and to hear their gratitude. And so thank you, church, for doing that. Thank you for offering yourselves, your bodies, and your time to do that. Uh, As a church, we want to continue to show the love and the grace of Christ through how we serve, as well as what we share. Um, And so the offering is about that. It's a small picture of representing and declaring that we want to offer our lives back to God. Um, so I'm going to pray right now for our offering. Um, if, you're, if you're new, that we have a variety of ways that you're welcome to give. They're on our website, uh, restorationrva.org. Um, but this is a chance where we get to give this to God and ask Him to do more than we could do ourselves. So let's join in prayer together. Uh, God, we thank you that you are not limited 
by our resources that all belong to you. And thank you that you've given us tangible ways to give back to you, to show our allegiance and our willingness to follow you. So God, we pray that you would take these small things and use them to multiply them for your kingdom. God, here now we offer not just our finances, but ourselves, our souls, our bodies to be a living sacrifice to you for your glory. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
like Jesus in the garden. You don't call where you don't leave. I want to love like you love. I want to bleed like you bleed. You may be seated. Well, as we are continuing on our sermon series called The Good Shepherd, where we're looking at Psalm 23 and how it connects also to the words of Jesus in John 10. And so the children's team and Christian Moore have put together a video that will help set up the children for their activity, but I trust will also impact you as well. Let's watch this video. and difficult places. The sheep trust their shepherd to lead them safely home. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are the good shepherd. And we look to you. receive your love, to receive your grace, and to receive your truth. Your truth that restores, your truth that sanctifies, your truth that sets us free. So we call upon your name now, Lord, to do a supernatural work through your word, for your glory, for your name's sake. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are in Advent, right, the weeks leading up to Christmas. And, you know, for me, Christmas Boy, those memories of growing up as a child, Christmas, those could have been absolutely nothing better, right? If you had taken me back to a five-year-old or six-year-old Jeff Lee in this time in in December, how excited I would have been for Christmas, right? Even as you see a potential picture, right, of, of when I was a child, there we are. There's me and my sister Heather, right? Look at that smile.
around with my parents to look at the lights and the luminaries in our community and surrounding communities. Those are some great memories. I remember around Christmas time feeling like I had more time with my dad. And that was super important. I also remember going on Christmas Eve to my childhood church. And my sister Heather and I would go to multiple worship services. And I loved singing not only the Christmas songs, but hearing this incredible news that God showed up in human form out of his great love for us. And so the depth of that feeling, that feeling of knowing, being known by God personally and knowing God, and that that was a true possibility. Now that, that was a true Christmas. Because I believe that that connected with the deep soul level need. And I believe that's our deepest soul level need. Our deepest soul level need is to know God and to be known by him. Right? All the gifts, all the stuff, all that is, is good. But what we really need, what we really need is Jesus. And so we're going to talk about that a bit tonight. Because all of us have a deep longing, a soul level need for God. A soul level need for his love. Right? The great thinker Blaise Pascal in his work Pensies says this. He says, what else does this craving and this helplessness proclaim but that there was once in man a true happiness of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace. This he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in things that are not there the help he cannot find in those that are, though none can help. Since this infinite abyss can be filled only with an infinite and immutable object, in other words, by God himself. Right here is this reference to what's known to be as the God-shaped vacuum or this hole in our heart that ultimately can only be filled by God himself. Right, the great Christian thinker Augustine, right, hundreds of years after Christ in his book Confessions, famously said this, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Rest in you. So I want to ask you a question are you restless? Do you find yourself to be restless? Right? Restless at this point. Restless in this season. Restless in this year, this 2020. Right? Marked by COVID-19. Marked by challenges and limits and losses. Do you find yourself to be restless? Restless. I know as I think about what I'm experiencing day and day out, I feel restless. Do you? Well, if you do, you've, you've come to the right place and you've come to the right time. Right here, right now, we've, this is where we gather in the presence of the living God. Right? To drink deeply of the waters, the living waters of Christ. To feed and to be nourished. To come together in the name of the Good Shepherd. And that's our focus these weeks. These weeks leading up to Christmas. That Jesus is the Good Shepherd. And we're looking at Psalm 23 in the Old Testament. The great psalm, the psalm that if you've been around the church, you know the psalm. Even if you haven't been around the church, you've heard references to different parts of the psalm. I believe that this is the case because ultimately this psalm points us to God. And ultimately points to God's son, Jesus, who reveals who God is. And in times of like this, we need to be pointed back to Jesus. And so if you find yourself to be restless at this point, if you find yourself in need of God... Know that Psalm 23 is a great way to reconnect with God. If you found that you have turned away from God or are moving away from God, Psalm 23 is like a great compass that points us back in the right direction. Do you feel discouraged at this point? If you do, Psalm 23 is a great psalm to provide you strength and comfort and renewed courage. Do you feel restless? Do you feel restless? Psalm 23. It's a great song to bring you back into the presence of the one who can give you true rest. And so last week, Bill started us off by looking at the first verse of Psalm 23, right? The Lord is my shepherd, right? I shall not want. Because he's our shepherd, as we look to him, we don't have anything to be concerned about. We don't, any, every need, every true need that we have is met. And so let me read uh, those words again from Psalm 23, verse, verse 1. And we're going to continue tonight into verses 2 through 3. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. All right, the first verse includes that bold claim just in review, right? What a bold prayer by David to say, the Lord is my shepherd. Right, the Lord, all capital, L-O-R-D. When you see capital letters, all capital letters for the word Lord in the Old Testament, it points to the personal name of God, Yahweh, which wasn't to be spoken by the Jewish people. And so here's this bold claim. The Lord, the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? The Lord of hosts, the God of angel armies, that this God, the one true God, can be called my shepherd. A personal, intimate description of God. Different than a rock, different than a shield, different than all those descriptions in the Old Testament, great ones as they are. But here, the Lord is my shepherd. Because of that, I lack nothing, I shall not want. So why is that the case? What does this shepherd do? In verses 2 through 3, we're going to look at four actions of this shepherd. Right? These four actions of he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Right? He leads me on paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Here we see David shows that this shepherd provides the basics, food, and water, right, protection, bring him, and put him back on the right path. So I want us to briefly look at each of these four actions and think about what our specific needs right now at the end of 2020 in this broken and broken down world as we look to the good shepherd. So diving right in, right, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Right, what an image, right, that sheep, sheep on their own will not lie down. It's not like a dog that you can train, right? A dog that you can train to eventually sit and lie down. Sheep cannot be trained in that way. Sheep lie down after they feel satisfied, after they've eaten and eaten well. And here the good shepherd is described, the, the Lord is described as one who makes us lie down in green pastures. And so it's an image, even though the word he makes us lie down sounds like a force. It speaks to God's initiative. He's the one who leads us in that direction. But the word itself that is translated makes me lie down speaks more to being settled down. In other words, to find rest. And the, the good shepherd, the Lord knows if, if the sheep are led to green pastures and they eat and they're satisfied, they'll then lie down. They'll be settled. They'll find rest. So the Lord makes me lie down in green pastures. The Lord also leads us beside still waters. What's important about still waters is that sheep, when there's moving water, definitely rushing water, the sheep don't want any part of that. But if there's still waters, the sheep will drink. And so a good shepherd knows to find either water that's still or even if there's moving water to create a little bit of a side pool for the sheep to drink. It's an intimate, beautiful picture of a shepherd taking care of the sheep. He, may, he, has, he leads these sheep beside still waters. And then we read these great words that the, sheep, that the shepherd restores our soul. He restores my soul. Right? He brings it back to life. Right? The word soul, which means it speaks of our life, both physically and psychologically, that, that the Lord brings restoration. What's broken, what's beaten down, what's tired, what's worn is brought back to life. What a great picture of the shepherd. And ultimately, this restoration comes by being put back on the right path. And that's where he leads us on the paths of righteousness. Right? Leads us on the right paths. Where we may be going in one direction. Heading in the wrong direction. On the wrong path. Where we think we could find life. Where we think we can find satisfaction. But the good shepherd says, no. Come over here. I'm going to lead you on the right paths. On the paths to life. On what's good. Green pastures, still waters, true life. There's the difference. And he does this, I love this, for his name's sake. Anytime you read about the name of Jesus or God's name, it speaks to his very character. 
And this is like his reputation, saying he's staking his reputation on this, that God himself, who is the good shepherd, Jesus, who shows us what the Father is like, that it's for his name's sake that he does this, based on who he is. So as you think about your life, tonight I want you to think about your life and the paths that you have walked on or are walking on. Where are you looking for life? Where are you looking for nutrition, not just physical nutrition, but life? Where are you looking for hope? Where are you looking in the midst of anxiety? Are you walking down paths that may not be the right paths, that are away from God, looking to other things, maybe to another person, maybe looking to a possession, maybe looking to an experience, looking to something else besides God, thinking that, 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 that whatever that something is, that relationship, that possession, right, that experience is going to fill that void, that God-shaped hole in your heart that the great thinker Pascal talked about. Are you walking in that direction or are you able to hear the voice of the good shepherd who wants to lead you in the right path and his direction towards green pastures, still waters, right? And on those paths, that's where he restores your soul. Because we could easily fall into the trap of looking away from God, looking to cheap substitutes, looking for things to satisfy us that ultimately won't satisfy us. In fact, like drinking salt water will make, just make it worse. The appearance of it seems great. As you move in that direction, you find yourself not satisfied in your hunger, but actually more hungry. Not having a thirst that goes away, but more thirsty. Or thinking that you're going to experience more love, but then you find yourself starved for that very love that you were looking for. But God has a different plan for us. God wants us to walk on the right paths. And the right paths are described by his word. His right paths are described by his law. In Psalm 19, 7, what a great verse. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul or refreshing the soul, or dare I say it, restoring the soul. Right? As we look to God, his way, his paths, it's not something that kills fun in this world. It actually gives us the space to eventually receive the nourishment, the right food, spiritual food, the green pastures. And when we eat and eat deep of what God wants to give us to us, and he satisfies that soul-level need in our lives, then we can lie down and be settled and experience the rest that he promises. But there's always that pull, that pull away from God, that pull towards those other things, right? those other the people or possessions or experiences that we think can fill that gap in our lives, but they can't. They only make it worse. So we need to hear that voice. How do we hear the voice of the good shepherd? Right? It's the voice of the good shepherd is the voice of a loved one. It's the voice of a friend. It's a kind voice. Do you know that, you know that every single person's voice is unique? Your voice is unique. I was talking to someone earlier this week. She was saying how there's someone's voice that annoys her to no end, and she always knows where she hears that voice. And so whether it's a positive or a negative thing, every person's voice is unique including God's. And there's a certain flavor to God's voice. And over the years, I've been asked, how can I hear God's voice? It's not that it's an audible voice, but it's a sense of a loving, kind voice, typically through his word, typically through prayers, and a sense throughout the day that go in this direction, but don't go in that direction. Right, John 10, 14 through 15, Jesus says this. He says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, Jesus says, and I know the Father. And he says, I lay down my life for the sheep. Right? The sheep know the voice of the shepherd. Right? Um, Ken Bailey, he's a, a Bible scholar and theologian. He had lived over in the Middle East most of his life, knew a lot of the, the languages of the Middle East, and had studied deeply. He tells a story of in the 1930s that the, in a Palestinian village, it was, there was an issue, there was an uprising. And those who were in charge, the British, decided to put that village on lockdown. And they took all of the sheeps and go, sheep and goats away from all the people. And they, were t they told the people, you could buy back your sheep 
if you paid a certain price. Well, there was a little orphan boy, and he had eight sheep to his name. His whole family, that's all they had taken away from them. And this boy somehow was able to earn the money to redeem those sheep. And so he went to where the sheep were all held together. As he went up to the British sergeant saying, here's the money. I want to get my sheep. The shepherd boy looked at the man and the man looked down and ridiculed him and mocked him. Saying, how are you going to find your sheep and all those sheep over there? There were hundreds of sheep. As the story goes, he went in and because this boy knew his sheep and the sheep knew him, not only his voice but his shepherd pipe that he played, as he played the pipe, as he called out, the eight sheep separated themselves from hundreds of other sheep to which the British officer stood in awe. Right? That's a picture in the midst of all that's happening of God's voice, the good shepherd. The sheep know his voice. Right? And the shepherd knows their sheep. And so for us tonight, what do we do with all this? How can we follow the good shepherd? How can we be led in paths of righteousness? How can we lie down in green pastures? How can we be led by still waters? How can we choose not to walk down the paths of unrighteousness, the paths that when we look to people and possessions and experiences to fill the God-shaped hole in our heart that we cannot ever fill? How do we do that? It begins, the action steps one, is to call upon God for his grace to hear his voice. To call upon God and say, God, I want to hear your voice. Okay, it's not going to be an audible voice, but a sense from God through his word, through prayer, maybe through conversations with trusted wise people to hear a sense of what's the direction I should go? What should I change? Where should I repent? That, that biblical word that speaks of a change of heart, a change of mind, a change of life, a change from moving in one direction looking towards all these things that can't deliver that are cheap substitutes and a turning back saying, God, I want to walk in this direction by your grace towards your green pastures, towards still waters, to a life that's restored. So first call upon God for his grace for his, and for his voice, to, to hear his voice and to change. Second is begin by identifying one wrong path. One wrong path, something in your life that you're looking to for help and for hope. Maybe as you're dealing with anxiety, maybe as you're dealing with worry, as you're dealing with discouragement, and it's, you're not looking to God. You're looking to someone else, a relationship, maybe an unhealthy relationship. Maybe it's something, a possession that you either have or something that you want to have, and, and you think, if I just had that possession, my life would be better. Or maybe it's an experience thing. It's my bucket list. If I just could do this, if this, if this stupid coronavirus would just disappear and I could have this experience again, I would be happy to say, God, I surrender that to you. It's not going to deliver. I surrender it to you. Take it. I ask you to consider what is one thing in your life that you could name that's pulling you in that direction. On the flip side, don't just go negative in terms of getting rid of something, but then saying, what can I then receive? And then say, God, how can I walk in this direction? What's the, the right path? How can I come to a place of green pasture? How can I come to a place of still water? How can I come to a place where you can restore my soul? Maybe it's reading scripture, picking up your Bible again. It's a great season to do it this Advent season leading up to Christmas. Right? To pick up the gospel accounts of Jesus' birth in Matthew or Luke or to look at the the cosmic picture of, of Jesus in John chapter 1. Pick up a Bible, read his word. Spend some time in prayer. Look for ways to serve others. Instead of looking to get something from someone else and to get, 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 maybe God's calling you to move in this direction and to give, give, give. And by giving, as Jesus wisely says, you give away your life, that's when you begin to receive it. So three steps to consider. First, yeah, call upon God for his grace to hear the voice of the good shepherd. Give up something. Turn away from something. Surrender something that's the wrong path. And look towards something on the right path. And embrace it. Surrender to God in a fresh way. Listen closely to what God has for you. He's calling you. The good shepherd's always calling. And it's a kind voice. It's a kind voice. Romans 2, 4, we read it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. That kind voice is drawing you back or perhaps drawing you to him for the first time. So in this Advent season, in this season of waiting, this 
season of expectancy, the season of hope and peace and joy and love and ultimately pointing to Christ. May we look to Jesus again as the good shepherd, the one who makes us lie down in green pastures, the one who leads us beside still waters, the one who restores our soul, the one who leads us on paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So we're going to take some time to pray. And in this time of prayer, I'm going to lead us through a time of prayer. We're going to, in that time of silence, I want to give you a, a little bit of space to let the Holy Spirit speak to you about, is there something that God wants you to let go in this direction, this path? And instead saying, God, is there something that then I want to take on, a way to rediscover those green pastures? Because it's a great place to be. So let me lead us in prayer, and then uh, we'll conclude that prayer by actually reading Psalm 23 together as a final prayer um, before we share in communion. So let me pray. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, and it's an incredible statement that we, because of your grace, can say the words, Lord, you are our shepherd, and because of that, we shall not want. So God, I pray for every person tonight who's engaging in this sermon, whether in person or online. God, I pray that you would meet them. Lord, you know their story. You know their struggles. You know, God, where each person is looking not to you, but to something or someone else for life. In this time of silence for a moment, Lord, bring something to mind, God, that you are calling us to surrender to you. So, God, we also pray now that you would show us, Lord, the green pastures, the still waters that are available to us. And, Lord, as we think about whether it's picking up our Bibles again, whether physically or electronically, Lord, whether it's praying, whether it's serving others, Lord, whatever it is, Lord, bring that to mind in this time of silence as we consider the right paths of following you. Lord, we call upon your name to lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake, trusting and believing that you will restore our soul. We look to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So you conclude, let's read together Psalm 23 of the ESV version. May this become, continue to be a prayer for us as a church family. Right. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Uh, during Advent, we're going to be celebrating communion every week. So this, this Saturday, next Saturday, Saturday after that, and Christmas Eve. The Advent is a time of renewal. It's a season of renewal. And as a church, especially since we haven't been able to meet together, we want to take this opportunity to be renewed and be restored as we're going to be taking communion regularly. Now, before we get into that, a quick word for those who are participating in worship online. Uh, we recognize that you won't be participating in communion today. And for many of you, you might not be able, you may not be comfortable to come to an in-person service. In light of that, what we want to do is we want to bring communion to you. Sometime in December, we would love to bring communion to your house to celebrate outdoors together. So if you would like to receive communion at some point this month, 
get in contact with your congregational care person, and they can help set up a time for us to celebrate together. Um, If you don't know who that person is or that you call this your church home but don't have a congregational caregiver, you can email info at restorationrva.org and then we'll set up a time for you. So that's going to be Sunday afternoons um, in the next two weeks. We would love to bring communion to you. I mean, today, even if you're here and you're not celebrating communion, let it be a time of reflection to think on these things that we're going to talk about and look to. In John chapter 6, Jesus tells people that he is the bread of life. This is an encouraging thing, but it also has an edge to it. And it has an edge because the people who he's talking to are people who've come to him. And what Jesus tells us is that the reason they've come is because they just want more food. They just want his stuff. They don't actually want to believe in him and trust in him. And he's speaking to people who aren't ready to trust. They just want to fill their stomachs. But still, even then, Jesus invites them to come after him. He says this, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never grow hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and you still do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that I shall lose none of those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Now, for us today, that probably no one is coming here expecting this to satisfy their stomach's hungers. Um, But we still come often with wants from God and asking him to, to do things for us instead of coming, him, coming to him in trust. And so as we receive communion today, that this is an act of trust, saying, Jesus, you are all that I need. Jesus, you are the most important thing, that you are above all else. You are my, you are my shepherd. Lead me. I trust you. That that's what we're doing today. But we also come as people who don't always say that, or don't maybe not have hearts that want to say that right now, or who haven't been saying that the last week, or month, or year. But we come to this place to say that back to God in a time of confession, where we bring ourselves to Him and we seek His grace. So we're going to be doing that by saying a prayer of confession together. It's going to be up on the screen, and I will, I will lead us through that. Let's say it together. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we all like sheep have gone astray and each turned our own way. We confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves, and we have looked to things and people for what you alone can give. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways all the days of our lives. To the glory of your name, Amen. Take a moment to have a time of silent confession on your own. Jesus' disciple Peter tells us in his first letter, Jesus himself bore our sins on his, or in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but you have now returned to the shepherd and overseers of your souls. Friends, that your sins have been put on Christ. You and I were sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseers of our souls, if we indeed trust in him. 
Now, communion at Restoration Church is not just for those who are a member of Restoration Church, but it's for anybody who has, who has given their life to Jesus, who's repented of their sins, been baptized into the church, and say, I want to follow him for all of my days. So that is you. We invite you to participate. If that's not you, we invite you to wait until there's a time when you can. Now, how we're going to do this, obviously, um, everyone but me is wearing a mask, and so communion doesn't fit through a mask. So, um, uh, and also, these things are kind of tricky. So, here's what we're going to do. Um, th- there is a, so the wafer is on top here. There is one thin kind of little cellophane thing that you can pull back. Maybe go ahead and try to do that right now, just so you and it's dark, so it's kind of hard to see. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to take the bread and the juice together. So I will go through the whole kind of, I'll, I'll say both parts, but then we will take it all together. So after you take the bread off, um, that there is also a piece for the, um, for the cup, and then that, that comes off as well. All right. Cool. All right. I still hear the rustling. Uh, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread and broke it and said to the disciples, this is, my bo- and I, this is my body broken for you, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took, in the same way, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Lord God Almighty, creator and sustainer of all things, the one who has made bread and juice and all other good things in the world. We thank you that you have given us these gifts. Even more, we thank you that you've given us the extraordinary gift of your Son. And we pray that through these ordinary elements that you would do spiritual work in our lives and our hearts. Pray that you would renew, restore, and bring us back to follow your paths all the days of our life. We look to you and your grace in the strong, powerful, and kind name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We did this song last week, or introduced it last week, and... um, kind of a reflective song so you're welcome to sing along but you're also welcome to sit and just reflect on who he is and what he offers and how you can be delivered into the good path that he offers
was an odd transition to what I want to say is, boy, I'm so grateful for this team and for this team and for the volunteers who came early to usher and who will clean up after. We are relearning how to do church. And uh, thank you for the grace. It's taking some adjustments. But boy, I mean, Eric Walter, Matt, Tina, Dennis, Ciders Girls, Addison, Wim, and Howard, who are hiding in another room, making sure this goes to Facebook well. Um, all of them. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> For this dear team here, um, it's so good. It's so good. So a couple announcements as we finish up. First, hey, Christmas Eve, we had plans possibly of going to the crossings at VCC, but because of restrictions and their unwillingness to let us come, and, and that's fine. But guess what? Ames, MCC has said, why don't you come and have Christmas Eve right here? Right, so we are going to have Christmas Eve in the sanctuary. Again, as, we're going to worship as safely and as faithfully as possible. And so everything will be set up, spaced out. But December, December, December 24th, 8 p.m. here for a Christmas Eve service. So plan on that. We are going to continue to meet here on Saturdays at 5 p.m. Uh, we ask that you register. We need registration so we can plan accordingly. Uh, but be looking for gatherings here both on Saturday at 5 p.m., online at 5 p.m., also the next morning. Uh, for those who cannot gather here at 5 p.m. or click in at 5 p.m., still Sunday mornings, 10 a.m. We want to provide as many connect points as possible for us as a church family uh, into our worship service. Uh, as we finish, we have one video, an opportunity to partner with uh, the church plant, the branch, and what they're doing up in Ashland. Let's uh, see a video from our dear friend John Gibson.
This is a great way to partner. All these years of us at different points having Angel Tree and other options up in Ashland and now with John and the branch up in Ashland, present in that context to, to be a blessing there. So let's look for ways to partner with him. One last uh, update. just want to give you an update on the vision campaign. Uh, you know, an email went out a couple weeks ago. Highly encourage you when emails come out. I know sometimes they're long, but we want to keep you in the loop communication-wise. Recognizing that you're getting flooded with emails and that you may not read every email that I send out. We want to give you a quick update as you look at this where we are. So indeed, indeed for us as leadership as we prayed, we said, God, we're giving this to you. We're not sure what the response is going to be. We're not sure where it's going to land. But I could tell you this, even for us, even with those with the gift of faith, we weren't sure we'd even come close to that. So God's at work, God's on the move, and God's preparing a space. And as we turn from 2020, praise the Lord, into 2021, God has great things on the horizon for us. And so as we finish, I'm going to close us in prayer and also for a word of thanksgiving about this. Um, as we continue to look not only to Christmas, but beyond into the new year. So let me pray for us as we finish. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this opportunity to worship you. It is so good to lift up your name. God, we need you. We are in a dry and thirsty time, and we need streams of living water. We need you. So, Lord, I pray that as we leave from this time of worship, I pray, Lord, that your blessing and that your grace will go with every single one of us. That, God, you would allow us to embrace your grace and to go out and to help our community embrace that life-restoring grace, the life-restoring grace of Jesus, and that we get to do this together. We give you thanks for your movement through this vision campaign. We give you thanks for the, the steps that we're taking forward as a church family. We give you thanks for McCainsville Christian Center allowing us to gather here not only on Saturday nights, but also on Christmas Eve. You are providing for us. You are a faithful, faithful God. And so may we leave and go now to love and serve you with our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I invite you as we conclude our service. For those who are here, we ask that you exit straight through the back doors, uh, ideally from the back row first and then towards the front so that we're not passing each other. And uh, head out right towards the front. You can leave uh, your communion uh, trash in the trash cans on your way out. Go in peace. Amen.